I, I remember uh, hearing an interview with David Mitchell um, a while back, and um, the, the interviewer asked him about about um, reincarnation, which comes up in all of his, his works. And he sort of just said that you know we have that a writer only has so many so many cards in his or her hand, and and you're just sort of playing out that that um, you know what you have to, to work with really. Um, no, that's so scary. <laughs> <laughs> so all you have to work with really is <laughs> interrogation. <laughs> interrogation, yeah. Um, but uh, but you 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 just mentioned that um, that you would sort of get two thirds of the way through and then and then move to another um, another story. These are all big stories. There's um, you know they're they're long. They're um, you get the sense that. Um, that you probably know how your characters take their coffee, even if there is never a diner um, involved. Um, how, um, you know, did, did you ever sort of feel tempted to say, oh, you know, fuck it, let's let's just make this a one scene? Um, I, but like, like, there's just this expansiveness. It almost reminds me of some of, of Edward P. Jones's stories that seem to really take on full lives. Is, um, you know, is that? Um, I guess. Uh, at what point do you do you do you stop a story? When do you um, reach reach the ending? You know, it takes a long time. I am that um, that single scene story that you mentioned. That's been like my life goal. Like, I mean, from the beginning, that's like all I want to do is write that one story that like takes place in a kitchen or like in a truck. And it's just like everything happens and, that's, and there's no backstory and it's all scene. And I can't figure out how to do it. And I and I think it's also like. Um, being in a workshop where those were my models when I first started learning how to write stories and so I just kept trying to do it and they were just like so bad and they had no energy like I just didn't know how to do it and it's hard because those are so many of my favorite story writers and um, that was just what I wanted to do and I just kept trying to do it and trying to do it and then it almost became this thing where um, I just admitted to myself like I love backstory and I love and I do need to know all the stuff about my characters and I need to know what their parents did and what their grandparents did and how they ended up in this place and like I just I felt unsatisfied when I was writing stories if I didn't know all of that. Um, but for a long time there was this sort of guilt that I had about it where I thought maybe these aren't maybe these aren't the stories that I'm supposed to be writing because they weren't I didn't have those models. And, um, and Edward P. Jones was one of my huge models, especially all in Anger as Children. Like when I read that book, um, it's just such a, those stories are so novelistic and you get, um, you get their backstories and you get the full lives and you also get a full sense of, like I feel like he writes about Washington DC in a way that like no one else has. And I just felt so fell in love with his stories. It was him, it was Deborah Eisenberg, it was Alice Munro, like Edith Perlman. Like once I just saw these stories, these people that were writing these 30 or 40 page stories where you could just kind of like let out a breath and just kind of live with those characters that I saw what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Like not that I could do what they do, but I, I saw like, okay, this is this is the model. Mm -hmm. At any point when we were working on these, did you feel tempted to, um, to expand any anyone into, into a full novel? No. <laughs> I mean, I'm writing, I'm, I'm writing a novel right now, um, but no, I just, they just felt like stories, and everyone, like, especially because longer stories are harder to publish, so that was another reason where I was like, I'm just going to write that one 15-page story, and it shouldn't be that hard, mm -hmm. and then even, like, the smallest stories, they just, for some reason, they just always would end up at 30 pages, and it was mm -hmm. like I had no control over it, and my characters would just do what they had to do, and then, and then they would end up. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so many of these of these stories are, are in in the first person. I think there's one or there are two stories that are, are in the third person, mm -hmm. um, um, and they they each you know you really get get um, feel feel like you're being told a story um, you know by, by by a person that you're not reading it really that um, um, that there's just this this um, precision of voice I think. Um, um, that sort of perfectly fits, you know, whether they're young or old or, or, or uh, man or woman, um, you know, regardless of nationality, that, that really, you know, the, the, the force of character seems to be sort of pressed through this, this, this sieve of, of the voice. Um, does, do you sort of begin with, with, with a voice and, and then the character emerges from that, or does the character sort of create the voice? Maybe that's sort of a chicken and the egg sort of question. But um, but but how how did you go about developing these 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 voices? It just would come to me, and 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 when they didn't come, that was when that was another 
reason that like I could feel the story not working as well. But once I would just sort of hear their voice and I would get a sense of the rhythm of their voice and just sort of cadence and those sorts of things, then I knew that I could um, that I could write the story. Mm -hmm. I think the voice is the most important thing for me. And I think also for a lot of these stories, they almost feel like testimonials or it's this, you know, it's like finally someone gets a chance to say their side of the story. Mm -hmm. And so that's why first person felt uh, really important to me. It felt like this decision that I was really thinking about a lot as I was writing. Um, yeah, and I think it was also, again, with models, like, it was reading Grace Paley and just trying to think about how she could just get that voice, and I just, just, or Leonard Michaels, um, and I think it was that, and it was also realizing that I loved a certain kind of old-fashioned story, where it's almost like someone says, a man sat down and told me the story, colon, and then we get the story, and suddenly that's the story, and I just fell in love with that, and I just wanted to try to do that, so with a couple of the stories, it was really that feeling of, of just being sort of like self-consciously aware of the act of storytelling and who's listening and all, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and I think that uh, yeah that, that it really um, I don't know it, it really works just just particularly in getting a sense of each character's maybe self deception um, or or the we we are we become as as um, as deluded isn't the right word but as um, we, we begin to wear the same blinders maybe as as the characters um, like like in the, in in the quietest man where. Um, in that moment where, where he realizes that, um, that his daughter is, is actually writing this play um, about his, his sort of greatest hour. It's just such a heartbreakingly wonderful, you know, I feel like, like tragedy is kind of easy. You know, it's, it's easy to gin up emotion um, when something bad happens, but, but being able to, to get that sort of, you know, heart swollen happiness um, is much more, more, uh, more tricky to, to pull off, I think. Um, but it happens, you know, repeatedly in, in, in these stories, in these moments that you're not really expecting, where, where you know, um, the uh, a son steals a bottle of of, of wine that his, his father can't afford, and and it becomes this sort of really tender, um, unexpected moment. Well, I'm so glad that you think that. Um, I I didn't know. I mean, you don't know when you're writing, like when anyone's going to think about it, and um, and I felt for a long time like. I became very aware and very critical of myself that I felt the only way I could write about joy is if I knew like the bus was coming around to kill my characters and I could only like really sit in that moment of joy if like it was all about to be over and I was like that's cheap and like I don't want to do that like I just need to really write about happiness sometimes because it is harder than um than writing about um tra writing about sadness or especially writing about tragedy where things are always happening to someone like the, I, I like the idea of someone who's who is maybe an inherently sad and desperate person, sort of seeking out happiness and seek and, and trying to do that. But um, but that was hard, and it was it was really only once I realized, like, oh, maybe this is a cheap trick if I can only kind of write about these moments of happiness with sadness looming over it um, mm -hmm. that I tried to do this other thing. So I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, sort of. Um, um, I feel like like some of these stories in here reminded me that um, you know when we, when we go to the movies, we never really feel sympathy for Brad Pitt. Yeah. Um, but we feel sympathy for Seth Rogen or um, <laughs> Chris Farley. There's something about about being sort of down on your luck, a bit, a bit, um, you know, a little overweight, and, and things just aren't going your way. That, that you know, you just want to give give the poor guy a hug. Um, and and I, I think that that uh, that these stories really um, really sort of capitalize on, on that sense of. of um, uh, that point maybe where um, where desire and vulnerability meets. Mm -hmm. um, that's where, that's where a reader's sympathy um, is born. Maybe. Oh, I like that. Um, but but so um, so in, in thinking of of you know you, you mentioned earlier this idea that um, that even one's imagination is autobiographical. Um, um, how how do you go about about um, writing something that is perhaps um, even if it is imagined sort of rooted in in one's own um, history? Um, did you come upon any sort of ethical or moral quandaries in in representing um, these these scenes that, that that might have you know close personal or familiar familial uh, meaning? Yeah, I worried about that a lot. Um, 
It's interesting. I, I worried about it with the earliest the earliest stories that I wrote. Um, the earliest story I wrote in that book was uh, Duck and Cover, which is about um, a girl coming of age, like um, in, in McCarthy, like um, in the McCarthy era, and um, and what and sort of the fact that she can't see um, all of the political activities that are, that her father is involved in, and that was one that was very much um, based on trying to imagine things for my mom. And I had this moment of like feeling excited about the story. I was young, I, mean, I wrote that story like oh, more than 10 years ago. And I had this moment of thinking like, wow, there's something in this story that, I, that feels really important to me and now I have to show it to my mom and see how my family's going to feel about me writing about any of this stuff. And I was so nervous. And I think if it were an essay, she probably wouldn't have been too happy. But the fact that it was fiction just kind of freed me up. And I felt like, okay, like she's excited about this and she feels like, um, she feels okay with it. And that was really the only kind of fear I had about that. I think with everything else, um, you know, I think these questions about, I mean, these ideas about, you know, only writing from your own experience, like, I just don't really, it just doesn't make sense to me with fiction. Um, I, I, think, I think with fiction, it's just about, for me, it's just like, having empathy for other people and trying to understand what life is like for other people and it's the whole reason that I read and it's so much of why I write and I think that if it's um, I think that if it's done not in kind of like an opportunistic way or um, but out of like a genuine genuinely curious way and a genuine way to try to understand it through the people then then I don't have ethical concerns about it mm -hmm. but I also think that it is I'm saying that because I'm writing about stuff that's closely related to my family, and I think if I were writing from, you know, I think it might be tricky if it were, I don't, I mean, I say this, I think for me it might be tricky to write about a place that I've never been to or that I had no um, <coughs> connection to, but some of my favorite books, and I mean, I think about Kafka writing America, and he hadn't gone to America, and do I have a problem with that? No. So. Mm -hmm. Did your mom give you any, any uh, corrections? Yeah, she got a little too into. Uh, yeah, I just feel like we're being taped. Um, she, she, um, yeah. I mean, she had some things that she wanted to say. I loved all the factual stuff that she would tell me, and it's really fun to find out, like how much a, you know, how much a motel room would really cost in 1954, or how much like an apple would cost. Like all of that is is incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes. And and she's read read the whole book. Yeah. I take it. Um, uh, that that that's uh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um. I mean, I would say the only thing, like, my family's been great, and I was really nervous about it. Um, just because probably every writer is nervous when their family reads their writing, and um, and everyone's been really supportive, but it is that funny thing where people call you and they say, oh, so is your father that character, or oh, who are you? And it's like, yeah, well, I'm is, all these people. One, which one is your father? No, my father's not there. Um, <laughs> but my father was, I mean, like, everybody wanted to, like, I felt like my family was really interested in that, and also, like, so did you really date this person, or what happened there, and, like, all that stuff. And it's interesting because I feel like, um, I feel like, the male narrators feel, those stories feel just as autobiographical to me as the female ones. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I mean, they're just these people that you create and they live in your head for so long that, if, if, you know, of course they're autobiographical in that way. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, did you have sort of, uh, you know, the book's been published to, 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 um, to great acclaim and um, did you have any sort of uh, separation um, anxiety mm -hmm. or, or any, is, has there been any sort of period of mourning now that um, they're not really yours anymore? They're the readers now. I know. You, know, you can't you can't change the words on the page. Um, they're sort of out in the world, and and these I imagine you know these characters that you've been carrying around in your head for ten years now are suddenly um, out in the world. Um, is uh, yeah? Is, is is there a sense of of, of loss? There was before the book was published. Like I was. I really couldn't let the book go, and I remember finally um, my agent called me and was like, "Molly, the book is done. We're sending it out." And I said, "No!" And he, you know, he has it like it's electronic, right? He has it on his email. So he's like, "No, no, no. We're really sending it out." And I called him back. Like, I just don't think so. I just need to look at it again. He said, "Molly, it's out. Like it's on email. Like it's out." And so that was a moment when I couldn't let it go. And then again, when I had to turn the book in, I um, had taken my dad, my dog, to a cabin um, up in Point Reyes, and. I um, was supposed to turn the book in, and I just couldn't let it go. And I, I was just like, it was, I was like, I would take a comma out and put it back in, take it out, put it back in, and I couldn't stop. And I was getting like phone calls from the editor and the assistant, and like Molly, we're waiting for the FedEx, and I just like, it was just this physical thing where I just like, 
and and I and it was when it's like it's it was when it was hard copy. It was like when I had gotten it back from the copy editor, so I had all these sticky notes everywhere, and I just remember like holding it and just thinking like I just don't know, um, and and FedExing it and having that moment at the FedEx office of thinking that I should be so thrilled, but just having this like kind of it sounds so hokey, but like having this moment of like God, I'm saying goodbye to these characters, and I don't know, and like I don't know, it's like I just I, I don't know what's going to happen. And, and it, it felt a little bittersweet. And, but I think because of the process of publishing a book, it's like you have so many versions of it and you're working on it with so many different people that by the time it was in galleys and then published, it did feel done. And I felt just, yeah, it, it felt done and it felt kind of good to think about new people. Mm -hmm. were, were the stories substantially revised um, between, since uh, some of them were published in, in journals beforehand, um, did you go back then and, and change those significantly? Yeah, it changed everything. Um, I think because it's a funny thing, like for everyone, for everyone here who's a writer, I wonder if it's something that other people think about. Like, I felt like I could make each story work the way that I wanted to, to send it out to a journal, or to feel like each story was doing what I wanted to do. But I think as writers, like we all kind of know our tricks. And so then when I had them all laid out, I was like, oh, here's like the way that I sort of took this step to get to this ending in this story. And I could see that I had kind of given myself a shortcut there in another story. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that because, um, you know, I'm putting together a book, not putting together a collection of stories. So I felt like that I didn't get to use any of my tricks in, in, when putting together the book and I had to dismantle the stories because of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or there would be like a, a phrase that I really loved in one story and it felt like it could, you know, you kind of like get to hold on to it for another story, but in a book you don't really get to do that. So all that stuff uh, took work. That's the, I'm just sort of <laughs> I'm going through that now where, where I just, read through this manuscript I'm working on and it's just like this it's like killer simile, you know, um, <laughs> on page three, but then it comes up a dozen more times. And it's like this sort of like little mental um, sort of it's you almost like insert it in, in a sentence so that you can just move on to the next one when you're when you're drafting and um, and uh, you know not because it's it's good even just that it gets you from it's sort of a little uh, you know leap in, in in having to do the real work. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, um, so I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Oh my god! <laughs> I mean, the scary thing is then you have to catch them because <laughs> yeah. you can't tell because it's so you're looking at it so closely. So yeah. Um,